So without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Judd Brewer. So what I'd like to do today is be somewhat deliberatively provocative. I think uh, Richie set the stage really nicely last night that as scientists, if we're truly scientists, we really need to rest in the not knowing because as soon as we start to get attached to views, we're no longer approaching things scientifically. So what I'm gonna put forward today are some examples and some ways that we can just play with, um, with this not knowing. I'm gonna put, put some things out there to hopefully uh, stir up some thoughts and maybe even poke at ways where we might be you know, we might be attached to certain things and we can explore those ourselves even. So what we can start with is, um, I'm gonna start with a cautionary note. There's been some really interesting work that's come out this year that I just wanna highlight. Um, and then I'm gonna get into how can we start to use methodology such as triangulation, which I'll explain, to help uh, bring things together so that we can decrease our uncertainty as we start to explore these questions. So for example, uh, triangulation in theory, triangulation in behavior, triangulation in neural mechanisms, and also uh, replication as a form of triangulation. And finally, um, this is the who cares part of the talk. It, importantly, and we even heard a little bit about this last night, it's really important that we link all of this stuff to real world outcomes. And so I'll try to bring some of that forward as well. So I'm just, there was a paper that came out that got a lot of press uh, in PNAS this year. Um, in the popular news, if you saw it, they described this as a bug in the SPM software. Uh, and and you, can, you don't need to read all of this, but basically what they found was that if, if people are doing cluster-wise analysis, that it's problematic. Um, and they were arguing that we need to test these uh, software packages against real world data uh, to make sure we catch these quote unquote bugs early on. So they were estimating that uh, tens of thousands of papers, I'm not sure if that's an accurate estimation or not, but this is the estimate, uh, may have been affected if people had done these types of cluster-wise analyses. So a, a very cautionary note um, in the field of neuroimaging and neuroscience in general. Now, there are, uh, and I'm gonna show a couple of slides that um, Richie Davidson was kind enough to, to lend to me, and I saw these when he was giving a talk at NIH earlier this year, and I wanna also highlight some cautionary notes here. So what he um, has been pointing out, I'm not sure if this is showing up properly, um, there was a paper that Kieran Fox put together where they're arguing that when, um, with these structure ana structural analyses that have been coming out with regard to meditation data, that there's, there can be publication bias and method methodological limitations. And, and so these are strong concerns. And Richie was concerned enough that he's uh, done the work to actually see if he could replicate some of these studies. So I'm just gonna show a couple of slides where these are based on um, a study that they're doing with MBSR versus health enhancement program versus a waitlist control. And they did analysis, and Richie, correct me if I, if I mess up here, but did analysis on brain regions that have been found to have differences in other studies uh, morphologically. So here in the amygdala, they found no differences. In the right insula, they found no differences between groups. Um, in the superior frontal gyrus, again, no differences between groups, whether it's wait list, health enhancement, or MBSR and also um, with the posterior cingulate cortex. So no differences in the structural uh, findings in, in their studies. So again, cautionary uh, tail, oh, temporal gyrus as well. So if, we're, if, we're, if we need to be cautious in you know, neuroimaging in general with our software packages, if we need to be cautious with um, ir irreproducibility of studies, what can we actually rely on so that we can move the field forward? And that's what we can explore together. So what I'm gonna just put forward as a very simple concept is if we can look at different, um, different spokes that point to a similar hub, then those might give us clues as places that we, that we can start as we're doing uh, research, as we're designing our studies, as we're doing our analyses. 
So for example, if there's overlap between something that's A, B, and C, in the middle, you know, if there's something that comes up, that might be very, very interesting for us to explore. So I'm going to give some examples of different types of examples of triangulation today, just as a way to uh, provoke conversation. Um, so one way that we can triangulate is if we can find where theory lines up with mechanism, whether this is behavioral mechanism or neurobiologic mechanism, and ultimately lines up with behavior. If all of these three align, then it gives us a little more confidence than that what we're looking at um, may be something that's worth pursuing further. So I'll just give an example of triangulation with regard to theory. And um, so the early Buddhist psychologists, as far back as the Pali Canon, so in the, in the Theravadan tradition, these are the, the early um, you know, historical teachings of the Buddha, there was this concept that's termed dependent origination. I've talked about this before, but for those of you that are not familiar with it, I'm just going to give a simplified view, which is that there's a, you know, there's a cue that comes into the mind that gets interpreted as pleasant or unpleasant. Um, then there's a craving that arises, so we want the pleasant to continue, we want the unpleasant to go away. This leads to a behavior. Uh, this is described in the Buddhist uh, language as the birth of a self-identity. Um, I'm using the word memory here, but this is the, form, uh, the formation of a sense of self, which then gets reinforced over and over and over. Um, the term is called samsara, or endless wandering, because the more we perpetuate this, the stronger this, I think of it as a habit loop, the stronger this habit loop gets. Now, importantly, the way they describe this is that this is all perpetuated through ignorance, because each time we learn to behave based on certain conditions, we start to see the world through certain glasses. So I think of these as... In modern day, we think of these as subjective bias, so we start to form a subjective bias through uh, the lenses through which we see the world. In early days, uh, they called this ignorance because we're not seeing the world clearly. And they also focused on this sense of self that gets solidified around this worldview the more and more we behave this way. So they described this 2,500 years ago. Can we triangulate on this in modern day? I already mentioned you know, this, this ignorance. We describe this in terms of subjective bias. Well, in fact, if you look at operant conditioning, one of the uh, best studied forms of uh, associative learning in modern day psychology, in fact, these two line up very, very nicely. I'm just using smoking and eating as an example here because these are, these are the two where these links have been um, nailed down pretty well. And so just as an example, something pleasant comes, um, there's a cue that comes in, this makes us, this feels good, we have an urge for that to continue, so we behave accordingly. And then in modern day literature, we describe this as laying down a memory that then reinforces that loop, whether it's positive or negative. This also increases the salience of future cues. So future positive cues become more salient, future negative cues become more salient as well. So we can start to see some triangulation between these early Buddhist psychologists as well as modern day uh, psychology and uh, behavioral neuroscience as well. So let's, uh, let's use another example. Um, so if we triangulate around behavior, can we also see how the theory, so I just described a theory, the early theories, the modern day theories line up. Does this line up with behavioral mechanism and importantly, does this line up with behavior? Um, so here, as I mentioned, operant conditioning, does this line up with a decoupling of craving and behavior, um, in this case smoking, and then do we see a difference in smoking cessation outcomes? Um, and again, here's that sweet spot if we can get all three of these to line up. I'm not going to go through the details of the study because we published it a little while ago, but I'll just highlight where we actually do see a decoupling of craving and cigarette use. So you can see there's a strong correlation between craving and smoking at the beginning of this trial where we compared um, mindfulness training for smoking cessation compared to the American Lung Association's freedom from smoking. This is completely gone at the end of treatment for the people who receive mindfulness training. And if you look at the moderation analyses, it has nothing to do with baseline craving, cigarette use, end of treatment craving, but it has everything to do with people practicing mindfulness. So the more they uh, learn to tolerate and be with their cravings, the less they actually act on them. So we start to see this decoupling of craving and behavior. So this is an example where we are seeing the theory line up with the behavioral mechanism, which lines up with behavior. Uh, we're starting to move into, this is kind of how it seems that the world is going. Um, so we're going to ride that wave. 
Um, we're now doing clinical trials with uh, app-based training so that we can increase the fidelity with, the, um, with which people receive mindfulness training for smoking cessation. This is an app called uh, Craven to Quit. We have a study that's ongoing at Yale where we're, again, studying these behavioral mechanisms to see if we can see those same changes, that same decoupling of craving and smoking with an app-based treatment. Um, Katie Garrison, one of my old postdocs, who's now an assistant professor at Yale, is, uh, is running that study. And just to give you an example of how this is delivered, uh, we can take our manualized treatment, we can cut it into bite-sized pieces where people can get short daily segments uh, and we can deliver these through animations, through videos. Uh, we can also give them in-the-moment exercises, which are harder to do in clinic. We're on a smoke-free campus. Uh, and importantly, we can also embed experience sampling so we can measure efficacy as well as mechanism. Uh, um, another example of triangulation with behavior, and again, looking for reproducibility and, um, and, and spreading of these types of effects, not just with one behavior, but others as well, if we look at the theory mechanism behavior around eating, I think we can, look, we can start to explore the same thing. So for example, can we decouple craving and eating behavior in where people are stressed and emotionally eating so that people learn to eat uh, based on negative and positive reinforcement, eat when they're not physiologically hungry, can we actually use mindfulness training to decouple that as well and start to see a reduction in craving-induced eating as well as, as weight loss? Um, here, this is a study that is led by Ashley Mason at UCSF. Um, it, the app is called Eat Right Now, and um, we have preliminary data, I can say, where we're also starting to see the decoupling of craving and eating behavior, which is great. And as a secondary outcome, we measured uh, weight loss, and we're seeing a modest but significant weight loss as well. So another example where we can start to line up theory uh, mechanism and actually see results. So now let's move into brain activity. Can we triangulate around brain activity? So we talked about theory, we talked about mechanism, we talked about outcomes, but can we also look at triangulation in different ways? Can we triangulate amongst different practices? So uh, some of the early work that we did, we studied uh, three different types of meditation practices and asked, you know, can we actually see, look for commonalities between different practices. There might be differences, but we're really looking to see, you know, is there something in the meat of where the three of these share uh, different neural mechanisms? So in the first study that we did with experienced and novice meditators, we looked at breath awareness practices, one of the most common um, practices out there, loving kindness practice, as well as open monitoring or choiceless awareness. Um, again, you know, seeing if we can have this theory mechanism and behavior uh, line up. So I'm not going to go through the details because we published this a while ago, and I've, I think I've even spoken about this before, but just to uh, capture the highlights, when we looked at experience versus novice meditators and we collapsed the analyses across these three different meditation practices, indeed we found only a few regions of the brain, when we looked across the entire brain, there were only a few regions that were different. Now here in blue means there was a decrease in activity, meaning that with experienced meditators, they were showing a decrease in activity in the medial prefrontal cortex as well as the posterior cingulate cortex, this, these two main hubs of the default mode network. Now it's interesting for those of you that were at Zindel's talk this morning, what he and Norm Farb found also was a decrease in the posterior cingulate cortex after mindfulness-based cognitive therapy training. Now, we wanted to, um, another way that we can think of triangulation is around replication and also importantly looking at different types of baselines to see, to make sure that we're, our results are actually solid. So we replicated this study with a larger sample size and looked at two different types of baseline. One was a resting state baseline, uh, which is the instruction is lay still and don't do anything in particular. What we'd found in our original study was that connectivity patterns were different between experienced and novice meditators, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So we wanted to look at a couple of different baselines to see if the baselines were driving these effects or if it was actually the, the practitioners and the practices themselves. So you can see here with an active baseline, we used a self-referential baseline. Um, where we just had people look at words and see if they describe them. This is a baseline that's well known to activate the default mode network, and we wanted to use this as a standard baseline across all participants. 
So when we looked at that versus just a resting baseline, we also see here, you can see in the posterior cingulate cortex, that there's decreased activity in experienced versus novice meditators. So we're starting to see a triangulation across different um, baselines as well as across different studies, which can give us a little more confidence that some of these results might be worth following up. Now, what also gives us more confidence is when people um, when other labs are finding similar things. So I'm just going to highlight a work that uh, Veronique Taylor published about five years ago now, where they studied experienced versus novice meditators. In this case, they were showing them emotionally provocative pictures. And again, they're seeing these two main hubs of the default mode network decreased in activity in experienced versus novice meditators. So again, a little more triangulation as this evidence starts to build. Now, the most um, recent finding and uh, what's often considered gold standard in neuroimaging is when somebody does a meta-analysis and they collapse the effects of a bunch of different studies together. So again, Kieran Fox, he's been a busy guy, um, published this study most recently, which was a meta-analysis of 78 different fMRI studies. They looked across a bunch of different practices. I'm just showing the one during focused attention here where they found across, um, there, were the only, there weren't that many um, parts of the brain that survived the analysis, but you can see here the dorsal anterior cingulate was a region that seemed to have um, consistent, or at least across the meta-analysis, um, was increased in activity, and again, you can see here in the posterior cingulate cortex, there's a decrease in activity. So we're starting to see some replication, which is, which is helpful. Now, I'm going to shift gears a tiny bit because, as Richie pointed out last night, it's not just about finding some magical brain region that's like, this is the compassion spot <laughs> or, you know, or whatever. So it's really important that we, when we find brain regions that are consistently activated or deactivated, we start to ask ourselves, well, what's actually going on in the entire brain here? What are the networks that these guys are talking to? How can we start to understand on a, more, on a, on a broader, more complex level what's actually going on? One way to do this is to look at connectivity analysis. And what this means is we can, we can ask, well, if there's a brain region that's activated, is there another brain region that's quote unquote talking to it based on a temporal correlation? So when this one's increased, is the other one increased? When this one's decreased, is the other one decreased? So we seeded the posterior cingulate cortex and asked what other brain regions are talking to the posterior cingulate cortex in experience versus novice meditators. And what we found was very, very interesting. What other groups have found is that in novices at baseline, so when you're laying still and not doing anything in particular, these two regions are anti-correlated, meaning when the posterior cingulate's active, the dorsal anterior cingulate is deactivated. Now, the dorsal anterior cingulate has been implicated in self-monitoring, in conflict monitoring, and things like that. So it makes sense when you're, you know, the, the default mode has been uh, most correlated with mind wandering and, um, you know, kind of not paying attention, being lost in, in um, internal narrative, well, you wouldn't expect monitoring regions to be online when we're mind wandering, so that makes sense. And we can see this in novices, we see an anti-correlation between the two. What's interesting is that in experienced meditators, and I'm showing the three different meditation practices that we had them do, we see in every single meditation practice, there's an increased cor um, temporal correlation or increased connectivity between these two regions. And in fact, we even see this at baseline in experienced meditators. So there's something different in these connectivity patterns in experienced versus novice meditators, which, you know, which is worth exploring. And it's also interesting because there have been subsequent studies that show using Granger causality analyses, whether, and some people find Granger causality somewhat suspect, so you can, this is a cautionary note with this. But what they find is when the dorsal anterior cingulate is kind of influencing the posterior cingulate and the other parts of the default mode network, we see an increase in uh, the capacity to perform cognitive tasks. And in fact, we see the opposite. When the posterior cingulate is influencing the dorsal anterior cingulate, for example, we see a behavior degrading effect where uh, behavior, behavioral performance is degraded. So we can start to see, okay, we see these connectivity differences in experienced meditators. How does this actually line up with the rest of neuroscience? And we can start to fill in the picture, for example, uh, with, with this study showing, okay, you know, we're starting to connect the dots here. Now, another thing that we found um, with the connectivity patterns, again, these were regions that were temporarily correlated with the posterior cingulate. 
was that, it, again, at baseline, novices have an anti-correlation between the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the posterior cingulate cortex. Dorsolateral prefrontal cortex has been implica implicated in, um, in cognitive control, in um, you know, kind of working memory, and things like that. Well, what we see at baseline is, again, experienced meditators show an increased connectivity pattern between this default mode network and this more executive or, or control network. Now, what gets really interesting here is during meditation, the novices seem to be increasing their correlations. So there, there's no significant difference between the groups. And this is novices who just learned meditation that morning. So they're doing something well enough um, where we start to drop the differences between these experienced and novice meditators, suggesting that you know, what we can see as state-dependent difference, baseline versus meditation, Whereas again, with experienced meditators, this seems to be more trait-like. Regardless of whether they're at resting baseline or whether they're meditating, we see an increased connectivity pattern. Now, how does this, why, you know, this is where the who cares comes in. How does this actually line up with outcomes? Now, there were a couple of studies that were published this year. David Cresswell uh, did a study where they, um, they trained uh, novice meditators in a very intensive three-day uh, meditation training. They had a very well-matched, um, basically, uh, spa-like control condition. And then they compared the two, uh, and again, looking at resting state functional connectivity. And what they found when they seeded the posterior cingulate cortex, again, was an increased connectivity pattern between the PCC, you can see here at baseline, this increased connectivity pattern is seen in the meditation condition, whereas it's not seen in the active control condition. You can see this. Um, both, both in the left as well as the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Now, where this gets interesting is when they look at outcomes. So in this case, they measured the pro-inflammatory cytokine IL-6. And what they found was that the increase in connectivity in the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex actually moderates uh, a decrease in um, change, so a decrease in IL-6 from baseline to a four-month follow-up. So they're starting to see a correlation between increased connectivity patterns and outcomes. So we're starting to link these types of things up. I'm going to highlight one other example. Tony King at the University of Michigan trained uh, veterans, OEF, OIF vets, um, in a mindfulness-based uh, training for PTSD. He compared it to an active comparison condition. This was a 16-week treatment. And what they also looked at, again, just like David Cresswell's group, they looked at resting state functional connectivity, seeded the posterior cingulate cortex, and they found increased connectivity pattern both in the dorsal and anterior cingulate as well as the bilateral dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So you can see here baseline, not much connectivity. That connectivity increases after treatment. You can see here on the left, on the right, as well as the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. Now, again, importantly, what he looked at was clinical outcomes. So when he looked at the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, he saw a correlation between increase improvement in CAP scores. So this is the clinician-administered PTSD scale. So improvements in avoidant behavior, improvements in hyperarousal that were correlated with increased connectivity patterns. So they're, again, starting to link up these connectivity changes with clinical outcomes. So these are just some examples where people are starting to bring this from theory um, neural mechanism and linking this with behavior. So I want to zoom back in on the posterior cingulate a little bit to see if we can actually um, start to dive in and, and ask questions about like what, what's actually going on here. And the PCC has a long and illustrious history in neuroimaging in the sense that there have been a ton of studies that have found posterior cingulate cortex activation. I'm just going to list a bunch of these, not that you have to remember them or that there's anything significant. But what I want to point out is all the different types of studies that show increased activity in the posterior cingulate cortex. And of course, I'm going to end with my favorite, which is craving. So when, pe when people crave, their posterior cingulate cortex gets activated. So when we started looking at this literature, we, we were really scratching our heads asking, you know, how the heck can we make sense of all of this? And so we can bring it back to um, triangulation. And I'm going to... I'm going to bring this a little bit to the contemplative theories now. Um, so my wife is a, um, a Hebrew Bible scholar, also a, a very devout Catholic and a, and a contemplative practitioner herself. And the way that she describes in Christian, or at least in Catholicism, there's a sense of a small self that's separated 
um, from God. And when we uh, let go of the small self, it allows God to flow through us. So there's this concept of a small self that separates us from God. In Buddhism, which I have a little more familiarity with, we talk about this concept of a self itself. And Matt too was talking about that a little bit last night, this, this fixed sense of, you know, I am somebody doing something. And the theory is that that creates problems, as we saw with the earlier slide on dependent origination. I'll just show another example. I'm only minimally familiar with this, but the Avita Vedanta tradition, they talk about this sense of a separate self. So when we're separated from the whole, there are problems. So if we take these as examples, is there a way to even triangulate around whether we use different terminology, but is there a way to start to triangulate around the actual experience that these languages, this different languaging is actually pointing toward? Um, one working hypothesis that we have is when we looked at this long list is that you know, the posterior cingulate cortex may be a marker, again, a marker probably of, a, of a, a whole lot that's going on, but a marker of getting caught up in experience. So if you think of the small self, we get caught up in, you know, the individual self versus, you know, God consciousness. If we think of, in Buddhism terms, you know, the, the idea that I am versus um, just a kind of a, fl a flow of causal experience. And again, I, I don't know how to describe it in the Avita a Veda Vedanta tradition, but we can start to ask this question, you know, do these triangulate around this sense of getting caught up, this experience um, or this experiential self, um, experiential as compared to a more conceptual self. So there's a differentiation between, you know, this concept, I wake up in the morning, I look at the mirror and I you know, look in the mirror and I remember, oh yeah, I'm Judd and I have to give a talk this morning, right? So that's helpful, so I show up for the talk. Um, what's not so helpful is if I get up in the morning, I'm like, oh God, I have to give a talk. Oh, am I, are they going to laugh? Are they going to, you know? And so I get caught up in that whole experience of, oh, I, I have to give a talk. So there may be a way to start to look at these neural mechanisms as a way to differentiate these conceptual senses of self and the experiential self um, and where one may uh, lead to suffering and the other may not. So um, I'm just going to see if we can dive in a little bit more deeply. This is actually from the, the first, the reported first sutta, uh, or the first sermon that the Buddha gave. It's, it's described as setting the wheel of dharma in motion. Um, and he talks about the cause of suffering. So he says it is the craving, that thirst, namely the craving for sense pleasure, craving for existence, and the craving for non-existence. So again, here we're not just talking about craving, so we're talking about craving for sense pleasure, but again, he's describing this sense of self that we become attached to, that we, that we start to cling to. So can we even use this as, and these are just, this is just a different translation of the same sutta. It's also translated as being, the craving for being, the craving for non-being. Is there a way that we can triangulate around craving itself? So, there was a paper, this very interesting paper that came out uh, in 2014 in PNAS where they had individuals uh, view different pictures, different scenes, um, read different, um, uh, I think, phrases that induce different types of moods. So this is similar to what Zindel was talking about where they can do a mood induction. What they had individuals do is do this across the different moods and then you know, in, in coloring, basically taking a human um, outline color in where they describe they experience these different mood states. So for example, um, when, when you induce pride, what does it feel like? How, where do you feel pride the most? So you can imagine you know, pride being this, you know, taking a, 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 a craving for becoming, you know, like, yeah, check me out. I, I did a great job with that. And we can see you know, this puffy chestedness um, that people describe this uh, as, as pride. Now, interestingly, you know, pride, I guess we could consider a, a positive versus negative emotion. We see similar patterns both in, with positive and negative emotions. So with anger, we see similar patterns described in people's experience. Fear, similar patterns described in people's experience. Anxiety, similar patterns uh, described in people's experience. So is there a way that we can start to look at this sense of self or this craving for becoming whether it's, you know, think of pride as something that I'm, you know, I'm holding myself up for, as well as this craving for non-being or non-becoming or non-existence. You know, for example, with fear, you know, what does it feel like when we're fearful? We're trying to make ourselves as small as possible so whatever that danger signal is, you know, isn't going to come and eat us. So can we look at these 
and start to ask ourselves, well, how does this actually line up with these neural mechanisms? Can we actually triangulate our experience, this experiential self, um, with neural mechanisms? And this is where I think this is something that Francisco Varela was really, um, was really helping us guide toward, which are practices, or um, techniques such as neurophenomenology. So here, um, with neurophenomenology, we can actually use first-person self-report. So look at those heat maps. What's your experience of pride? What's your experience of anger? What's your experience of fear? And we can use these to better understand cognitive processes. So we can start to link up our subjective experience with our brain activity, just as one example. And we can use uh, different methodologies, such as grounded theory, so that we can drive, uh, take data to drive theory. And I'll just give you um, a, one way that we've been exploring this. So a couple of years ago, one of my colleagues at Yale had developed a real-time neural feedback set up at, in, with an fMRI machine. So we can take targets. Um, in this case, we looked at the posterior cingulate cortex because it seemed to be the most consistently um, uh, deactivated during meditation, where we can give people feedback. We can also give them feedback from dummy regions to make sure that they're uh, not fooling themselves during the experiments, but we can use this as a way to start to map together their subjective experience with their brain activity. And I'll show you what this looks like. Some of you have seen me talk about this before, so I'll go through it quickly. So basically, we can show people a, a graph of increased activity or decreased activity in their brain, in this case, the posterior cingulate cortex, in real time, or basically in real time with a slight lag. And we can have them a remark or kind of make a mental note of their experience as they're meditating or as they're not meditating so that they can say, yeah, that correlates, that, in, that increased, uh, that spike of increased activity correlates with this, or that decreased spike of activity correlates with this in terms of my subjective experience. What we first did was just to see if the people's experience correlated with these graphs. Um, they reported an eight out of 10 correspondence so that they were reporting these pretty um, pretty consistently. You can see here, I, I just show this as a dramatic example. We see with experienced meditators very different brain regional activity. So again, in real time, we're confirming that the posterior shinglet seems to get deactivated during um, meditation. But we can take that one step further and start to ask the question, well, what's actually happening during this? What's ap actually happening during this? What's actually happening during this or this or this? And what we could do, and this was in collaboration with uh, Kathy Kerr and Juan Santoyo, who at the time was an undergraduate at Brown, we could take transcripts of people's self-report after they'd gone through one or three minute meditation practices where they report this was this, this was this, this was it, and in a blinded manner start to bin these in, um, in different uh, open codes. So this is their raw data. So if somebody was thinking about an object, it went into this box. If somebody reported being tranquil, it went into this box. If they were focusing on their body, it went into this box. And then we can group these into more central codes, and then we can group these into theoretical codes so we can start to line up their actual subjective experience with their brain activity in a completely data different way. Now what this looks like, so here I'm just showing examples of activation in the posterior cingulate cortex. What we see is what many other studies have found, so you can think of this as a positive control. When people report being distracted, which was a fair amount, um, this correlated with increased activity in the posterior cingulate cortex. But there was a whole other category that came out of this analysis that we had not been expecting. So we, we theoretically coded this as controlling. So there were so many reports of people trying to do something or being discontent um, with different objects that there was a whole other category that we just deemed, uh, that we just termed controlling that correlated also with activation in the posterior cingulate cortex. I'll give you an example. So here's somebody reported, I worried that I wasn't using the graph as, as an object, so I tried to look at it harder or somehow pay attention more, and this is where it went red, you know? So if you think of awareness, how hard is it to hear my finger snapping, right? So this was somebody, you know, awareness is just there, it's, it's there, it's available, but this was somebody who was trying to force their awareness and they found that there was an increased activity in their posterior cingulate. Now, in contrast to increased activity, we found, again, just like many other studies, when somebody's concentrated on an object, and this doesn't have to be experienced meditators, that we see a decreased activity 
in the posterior cingulate cortex. But again, this opposite category of effortfulness, if you want to describe it that way, uh, came out over the analysis as well. So we just term termed this effortless doing. So when people were not efforting, when they were content, um, they also reported um, their, their brain activity was, it was decreased. So here are a couple of examples. Somebody said, toward the middle, I had some thoughts, which I don't see in the graph, maybe because I let them flow by. I noticed the more I relaxed and stopped trying to do anything, the bluer it went. Um, typically, the next slide I'll show is a joke about Yoda, but I'm not going to show it today. You know, but this is really what Yoda was talking about. You know, it's not about trying. It's, about, it's just about doing. So, let's, so we can start to use neurophenomenologic techniques to really drill down into our actual phenomenologic experience, our subjective experience, and start to line it up more one-to-one -one with markers of, of brain activity. Now, I'm just going to show... Um, one more example, and then um, and I'll try to finish with plenty of time for discussion so that, that uh, this is really a conversation rather than me standing up here talking. So can we triangulate a little bit more around um, if we bring theory, so if the theory is this not-self in Buddhism or releasing of the small self in Christianity or merging with the greater self, if I'm using that term correctly in Aveda Vedanta, um, can we link this up with neural mechanism? So, for example, with PCC deactivation, if PCC activation is a marker, again, just a marker of this getting caught up in experience, can we, can we start to study whether a decrease in PCC activation actually correlates uh, with, um, with behavioral outcomes? So I'm just going to... Uh, we've just started a study now um, that was funded by the uh, NCCIH where we can actually take... Um, app-based training, so in this case our Craving to Quit Smoking Cessation app, we can randomize people to get that training or the National Cancer Institute's Quit Guide, which is the app that they put out, and we can start to ask the questions. If we give people this training and we put them in the scanner pre and post, can we see differences in PCC activation when they're uh, provoked with images of people smoking? So we can, can we start to link up this um, you know, this behavioral uh, paradigm with neural mechanisms, and importantly, uh, can we link this to behavioral outcomes, such as smoking cessation? So this was a study uh, that we've just started, but I think this is an example when, when we can start to triangulate this theory in terms of, you know, not getting caught up in our experience, how this lines up with neural mechanisms, and importantly, behavioral outcomes. So I'm just going to finish with, um, you know, there's, there was a plea last night, there was a question about, you know, can't we just move this work faster and get it out into the, into the public? And I think that's something that we're all really committed to doing. But we have to do this carefully. We have to do this at the pace that science is going to let us do this. So we've been slowly moving toward, you know, how can we actually apply some of these techniques in the clinical setting? Of course, fMRI is never going to be clinically pragmatic. Um, the, the neurofeedback is actually a little slow to really give people accurate feedback. So we've been, over the last couple of years, and this, uh, this project's really been led by um, one of my senior postdocs, Remco van Lutterfeld, can we actually start to replicate what we're seeing with real-time neurofeedback with fMRI with, um, with EEG? So in this case, we're starting to use source-estimated EEG where we can use 128 leads and estimate, it's not as good as fMRI, but we can start to estimate regional brain activity. So this isn't scalp electrical activity, this is regional brain activity. We, can, we, can ask the, we started by asking the question, you know, is this, is this good enough? Because we, we weren't even sure if these techniques um, were, were good enough. So we did a, a double-blind test battery where we had individuals uh, meditate and we could randomize uh, whether somebody, whether the graph uh, decreased activity in the posterior cingulate was up or down. So they actually had to figure it out. They would look at the graph, they would meditate, and they would look at the graph afterward. So they could then start to line up and form a working hypothesis themselves around, you know, does, it, does increase or decrease in the graph correlate with my experience of deepening meditation practice? In the next step, we could have them look at the graph in real time in, in a similar manner to, that we did with the fMRI, so they could uh, think of this as confirming. You know, so they're learning and then confirming that that's actually the case because they're seeing a better temporal correlation between their brain activity and their subjective experience. And then finally, we can do a verification where we have people manipulate the graph. So we say, okay, make it go in the direction of meditation so that we can confirm that they've and verify 
that they've actually, um, you know, that their subjective experience actually lines up with their acti brain activity. We'd done a study like this with fMRI previously, um, and now we wanted to see if we could do this with, with EEG. Um, I'm just going to give the highlights here. You can read the paper. But basically, their moment-to-moment -moment correspondence was, again, on the same level that we'd seen with fMRI. So with novices, it was 8 out of 10. With experienced meditators, it was 9 out of 10. Um, what they were also able to volitionally control the graph. What I'll point out here is with the novice meditators, because they were novices, we trained them in simple noting practice. So this is a Theravadan practice that we'd seen clinically work very well for smoking cessation, where you simply notice whatever's predominant in your experience, whether it's vi you know, visual, hear seeing, hearing, feeling, or thinking. And even the novice meditators, after a short bout of learning how to do noting practice, could even start to, uh, in, a, in a significant manner, at least statistically significant, move the, uh, move the graph in the direction of meditation. So, I'll, and I'll just show you, I'm just going to end with a, a highlight, because uh, this wasn't actually one of our study participants, but this will give you an example of, um, of how this actually works. Uh, Anderson Cooper came to our lab um, this and is just kind of donated next his brain. Of exercise. We've got the physical you know, exercise components uh, down. And now it's about working out how can we actually train our minds. Dr. Brewer is trying to understand how mindfulness can alter the functioning of the brain. He uses a cap lined with 128 electrodes. We're going to start filling each of these 128 wells with conduction gel. The electrodes are able to pick up signals from the posterior cingulate, part of a brain network linked to memory and emotion. This is all just picking up electrical signal from the top of your head. Since attending the mindfulness retreat, I'd been meditating daily and was curious to see if it had an impact on my brain. We're going to have you start with thinking of something that was very anxiety provoking for you. Okay. When I thought about something stressful, the cells in my brain's posterior cingulate immediately started firing, shown by the red lines that went off the chart on the computer screen. Just drop into meditation. Okay. When I let go of those stressful thoughts and refocused on my breath, Within seconds, the brain cells that had been firing quieted down, shown by the blue lines on the computer. That's really fascinating to see like that. Dr. Brewer believes everyone can train their brains to reach that blue mindfulness zone, but he says all the technology we're surrounded by makes it difficult. So, so what we're pointing out here is I think we can, this isn't something that, you know, you suddenly hook yourself up to a neurofeedback machine and, and now you're a Buddha or something. But... <laughs> But the point here is, sim you know, as humans, we learn best through feedback. And this may be a modality that we can use to help provide a mental mirror for people to see what their brain activity is doing and how it actually correlates with their subjective experience so they can delve into that, so they can dive into that more and say, oh, you know, what does that actually feel like? Oh, that's interesting. This, this provokes me into looking at my own subjective experience a little bit more. So I'm just going to finish um, uh, with a couple of concluding, you know, and again, I, I say this for further consideration because hopefully this is just, you know, this is something that will get us thinking about how can we actually take what we know from our studies, from when we're designing studies, when we're trying to design clinical outcome, um, you know, uh, clinic, or way, new clinical tools, how can we think through all of these things in, through a lens of triangulation? So again, I think we need to be cautious in science, but again, we don't want to be so frozen that we don't do anything. You know, there's this uh, quote from um, The Life of Pi, you know, he talks about I immobility um, or doubt as a philosophy for life is like immobility as a means of transportation. So I don't think we want to immobilize ourselves and say, oh, neuroscience is terrible. But at the same time, we have to be cautious and ask ourselves, well, what are the techniques that we're doing? Can we reproduce our studies? Do all of these things actually line up? So replication is really important here. And again, can we start to not just replicate our studies, but can we start to look at common ground? And I hopefully gave you some examples of different ways that we can triangulate. So can we explore where theory, mechanism, and behavior converge? Can we explore even where within different practices there's a convergence, as we looked at with, um, with different meditation practices? And importantly, really, uh, at least uh, this is my view, is can we really link these to real world outcomes? So we see, you know, um, Richie alluded to the McMindfulness movement last night. You know, 
are we, are we looking for like killing it on Wall Street or like ascending spirals of bliss? Or are we actually looking at how all of these uh, contemplative practices and these contemplative traditions come together in the way that they describe decreasing and ultimately ending suffering? So I will stop there and um, I'd like to acknowledge all the folks that put so much work into this. Um, and, and most importantly, our subjects who donated their, their brains, literally, for the, for the research. And then we've, um, we've been fortunate enough to get um, uh, mostly NIH funding uh, to, do these, to do this research, as well as uh, the folks in my lab, as, as well as the collaborators that we've worked with over the years. So I'll stop there and would be happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you very much. All right, so if you have a question, please step up to the mic. Please. Yes, yeah, so you go to these uh, mi mindfulness talks, and uh, most of the time you get the sense that dorsal or, uh, default mode network activation is bad. Um, in, but, you know, it's there for a reason, probably. I mean, you know, the salience network is there for useful reasons and all that. Right. And then, so I see the thing, the slides talking about effortful activity in the brain uh, activating the dorsal, uh, the, you know, uh, and then, so reading the classical literature on the nine steps of shamatha development, there's a lot of effort, there's a lot of talk of effort in the first five or six stages of development of calming. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm confused as to what, <laughs> you know, just what, you know, where is that involved? Right, it's a great question, and I'm not going to be able to give an exposition on the, the different steps of shamatha. Um, but I think what we can look at here is, you know, how are we directing our effort? So how much effort does it take to be aware? And where is the effort directed? So exam example with stabilizing the mind, can we direct effort toward bringing the mind back as compared to trying to force the mind? So I'm more familiar with like the factors of awakening in Theravada Buddhism, where they talk about the factors that are necessary include tranquility, um, they include, um, you know, kind of this, this courageous energy but it's not about, there's nothing in there is about like just white knuckling it or, or clenching our teeth and forcing anything. So I think we can start to use this as a way to explore what do we actually mean by effort? And what are the conditions that we can create that support concentration, for example, as compared to things that are very brittle and are kind of based on, you know, me doing something. So I think it, it's more provocative in, in the sense that it can, uh, kind of blow up in our concepts of, well, do we really know what effort means? And can we start to explore what it means from an experiential standpoint? So I think it's a really great question, and, and hopefully this just says, oh, maybe that's something for us to really explore. What does this actually mean? So thanks for the question. Um, we'll take one from this side, please. Yeah, hi. Um, at the end of the 60 Minutes segment, uh, uh, Anderson Cooper said that um, this mindfulness practice or this meditation practice um, is so useful given the distractions and the increase of technology that surrounds us. And yet, uh, you're also purporting to uh, propose an app um, that you can log on to in order to mitigate craving. And this, uh, now the use of tools and techniques is not uncommon in. Uh, meditation practices. I mean, in Tibetan Buddhism, of course, the mandala and all sorts of uh, tankas enable you to acquire focus and at least guide you through a process. But can you talk a little more about the role of technology and meditation and uh, where you think it's headed? Sure. I'll talk a tiny bit, but I, I'm also going to save a lot of that conversation for tomorrow night mm -hmm. because that's the theme of tomorrow night's right. talk. Is that right, Amishi? Yeah. So, really briefly, the way I think about this is okay, everybody's walking around with their phone, and my folks who are trying to quit smoking, they go out on a smoke break, cigarette, phone. So how can we use what they're holding in their hand to help with what they're also holding in their other hand? Um, so I think of it as, well, this is ubiquitous. How can we most skillfully use technology to help people, you know, paradoxically or ironically overcome their own addiction? And, and eventually you could see it uh, using an app to overcome your addiction to your cell phone. Right? So that's, that's the way I think about it is we need to use whatever, you know, whatever's available um, and, and th this is what people are already holding in their hands. So that's a good place to start. Thanks for the question. Really good question. Please. 
Thanks, thanks for your talk. Um, one of the th features of your talk that I really liked was the emphasis that you placed on caution in science. And um, as you know, there's this huge sort of replication crisis that we're all dealing with. And uh, you touched a bit about this, but I was wondering if you could say more about how that has uh, affected your own view of the state of the science as far as, far as contemplative practice goes. Has that threatened some of the findings that you see in the literature? Has it um, um, changed the way that you do your own work in, in, in any way? It, it's a good question. We, just looking to see, I want to answer honestly, because in retrospect, I can tell you a great story, um, but it might not be true. When we, <laughs> when we did our first study, it was only with 12 experienced med meditation practitioners. And so we knew that that was a pretty small sample size. And so we set out to immediately replicate that. And, and it took us several years to get the number of experienced practitioners um, to replicate that study. And we had started adding in neurofeedback as a way to confirm, you know, like their, if we could see that their subjective experience lines up in real time with their brain activity, that gave us a lot more confidence that there was something real here. So we had immediately started, you know, we're trying to really not believe our own hype and ask, you know, is this really true? And so before this non-replicability stuff came out, you know, like with this, bu this SPM bug, um, we'd already published several papers, including replication papers, and had been doing work with the neuro neurophenomenologic feedback. So we were kind of triangulating in a way to really make sure that we felt confident with this. But this, I've just been somewhat, uh, I try to be somewhat cautious because I don't want I mean, the worst thing that I could do, especially if we're trying to translate this stuff clinically, is to put something out there that's, that's actually going to make people worse. So I take my Hippocratic Oath very seriously that I, I really cannot, I can't afford to do harm. So we're, we try to be very, very careful about that and also very open-minded. Like, as soon as we start believing our own hype, then we're no longer scientists. So it also helps, you know, Richie talked about last night about being humble. I think the, the heavy dose of humility is, is really helpful for that. Um, so, so thank you for the question. Yeah, yeah. please. Hi, um, thanks. Thanks for your talk. Um, I had a question about. So you were talking about. How and can you? I can't hear. Oh, that well. can you hear me now? That's okay. So um, you were talking about the Buddhist concept of no self and relating it to the deactivation of the default mode network, and I was wondering uh, what you thought about um, what 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 are the parts. What, what are the um, benefits or potential benefits of having a self? Or, um, you know, is there, why do we have those um, parts of the brain, like the default mode network? I mean, can, do they have some kind of evolutionary um, advantage? Or uh, could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, great question. I'm, so I can give you some, some BS, some baseless speculation. Um, and I'll keep it brief, because there are probably other people in the room that can speak to this better than I can. The, the best that I, my working hypothesis is that somewhere in there we needed a sense of time so that we could harvest crops, you know. So when we became more agrarian, I don't know how many thousands, hundreds, I don't even know how long ago that was, um, we needed to have a sense of, you know, who we are so we know where we planted the crops and when, you know, when to harvest them. So that's a very simplistic working hypothesis that I have around, you know, it can be helpful to kind of form this time stamp of like, oh, I did this, or I left my keys here, um, that, that may be helpful uh, functionally. But as soon as we start taking that self too seriously, when we start getting ca caught up in it and so caught up, you know, addiction is a great example. When we're so caught up in our cravings, the definition is continued use despite adverse consequences. We're so caught up in it, we, we can't do anything about it. That's problematic. That's, that's not going to help us survive. So there may be something where we've dialed in so much. And even if you look at society now, there, it's a very me, me, me society. You know, YouTube, it's me tube, right? And Twitter is me. Facebook is me. You know, so it's all about perpetuating where that sense of self gets, gets perpetuated. And there are good studies showing that it actually activates the uh, reward centers in our brain. So there's something that kind of that's, we've tripped into uh, um, through social media that kind of locks in this evolutionarily adaptive function that now makes it a little less adaptive. Yeah, great Thank question. You. Thanks. Please. 
Hi. Um, yeah, really good talk and great body of work. So, yeah, sorry, it's a bit of a gnarly question, but the gamma band um, things that you showed with the EEG and the feedback, could you say why it's not possible that that's not just a muscle artifact and people are, say, even un unconsciously clenching their jaw or something like that? Yeah, it's a good question. So gamma is is um, historically considered, you know, we we kind of discount gamma quite a bit. I won't go into all the details in, in my postdoc. Uh, Dr. Van Luderfeld's right here. He can give you more details. That paper was more control experiments than actual data. And so I didn't have time to go into it. But we wanted to make sure we weren't fooling ourselves, especially with this new technique that we were learning. So we did a ton of different control experiments to make sure as best as, as we could tell that this wasn't just muscle artifact. Yeah, so I would, I would encourage you to read the paper and, or, or talk to Rumco. Yeah, good question. Please. Um, uh, <clears throat> I wonder uh, if you could comment on two things for me, please. One is uh, self-administered neurofeedback using the Muse, this uh, Bluetooth uh, EEG self-administration. What, what's the implication of that? is one. Number two is, um, in meta practice, in compassion training, uh, as it's explained to me, and I'm a neophyte, you know, there's a point at which you take the self-nurturing comments, I, may I be happy, may I be healthy, may I be safe, yeah. and then you switch that and you direct it to someone else. Does that, is anybody studying what the neurobiological construct shift is mm -hmm. as you go from regarding self versus other? Yeah, that's a great question. So the first question, I'm, I'm actually not going to publicly comment on the muse. Um, so <laughs> I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, but the second one's very interesting. And we've, we, a couple of years ago, we published a paper on loving kindness practice. And I think your question takes it one step farther than what we looked at it our, ourselves, which is, can you separate out you know, whether it's direct, self-directed or other-directed? Um, what our hypothesis is and what we found in that paper was, again, decreased activity in the posterior cingulate cortex. And our working hypothesis around that is that whether loving kindness is this expansive, this is, you know, expansion, it just feel, it's hard to describe, but it's like it, this as compared to pride or fear or anger. And whether we're directing it toward ourselves or others, if it's, if it's, if it's, I don't, I hate to use the word, if it's done properly, but if it's done, it, it's not going to be different in terms of this expansive quality of our experience, whether it's directed toward ourselves or others. So we would see, com we would, I hypothesized that we would see commonalities there, and we did, but we, we didn't look specifically beyond that to see if, you know, if you direct it toward others, like the difficult person or all beings, what are the nuanced differences between those? Um, so it's a good question that we've, we've not looked at. Please. Hi. Um, I have two questions, and because I'm one of only two women up here asking questions, I think I can do that. Um, <laughs> One is pretty simple, which is, is there a right and left hemisphere difference in the regions you discussed in terms of activation? And the second um, is a bit more complicated. You said, and I agree, that we humans learn from feedback, but I think we humans learn from human feedback. And what the baby gets from the gaze of the mother is something that I doubt could be duplicated. But so, um, as adults, I'm curious about how, how you envision the possibility of us affecting our brains so singularly and outside of a relationship. So what was the last part? So singularly? Outside? Singularly, as an individual separate entity, yeah. me and myself and my neurofeedback machine. Yeah. I, so I don't want to sound too like far out here, but... I don't think of any of that really being different. We learn, I mean, we're not really separate. Um, we think we are. And I, I think that we learn from all different modes of feedback. So we learn certainly from relationships with others, as you described. I think we also learn from relationships to ourselves. So for example, 
as we start to become more interceptively aware, that opens up a whole avenue of feedback that might not have been accessible before when we're divorced. You know, often we're walking around as these divorced heads from our, from our actually, actual bodies. Um, and I would, I would then hesitate to exclude any other type of feedback from our experience as well. So if our relationships with others is feedback, if our relationships with ourselves is feedback, where does the feedback end? And I don't see an end to us learning from feedback from our environment. And in that sense, you know, it's like, it's, it's all grist for the mill. And so these, these machines are just another modality where, that we can add to the mix of feedback that we're getting. Yeah. Um, I don't remember what your first question was. Oh, we, most of the uh, differences that we've seen have been pretty midline. We have not seen uh, laterality differences. Please. Last question. Hi, um, I was wondering about uh, repli replicability in these studies and specifically cross-cultural replication. Um, and especially as that relates to the idea of the self and whether, you know, I mean, I don't know what the samples were in any of these studies, but whether um, like sort of isolating the sense of self within the PCC, like how that makes sense with the idea of convergence, but whether that might also be somewhat reductionist and whether you know, in a cross-cultural setting especially, whether like different conceptions of the self would, you know, have different brain patterns or. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And um, that's, you highlight an avenue of work that needs to be done. So I've seen a few studies, very few studies, where um, folks have tried to look at self-reference and self-concept in, I think in China, so in, in Chinese populations versus, in, I don't know if they compared them directly to Western populations, but that's the beginning of the work that you're pointing out that needs to be done. I, and I'm guessing we could both hypothesize that we're gonna see some commonalities and we're gonna see some differences, especially when, there's a, when we grow up in cultures that might be more individualistic versus more, um, more I, don't know, I grew up in an individualist society, so whatever this, <laughs> The, more, the broader, the broader good society. So um, yeah, I think those are those are studies that absolutely need to be done and will help fill in, you know, the nuanced pieces of of these things and also help us see where we're finding, you know, these these evolutionarily conserved pieces. Like, is the default mode evolutionarily conserved across, you know, all cultures? It's a really good question. Thank so you. So thank you very much. Thank you all.